everyone, Perdek here, and in today's video, I'm going to do a start to finish with the rolling and block printing so I can show you my entire process so people can understand how I do it. So first off, I do my design right here. I've got one right here. It's done on Mylar, and I use my Molotow pens right here. These are my favorite pens in the world to use. Um, they write very well on the Mylar. Uh, in my designing series, you can actually, or in my designing episode, I should say, you can actually see more about my process and how I do this. And then the next thing I do is I put this on my scanner and I scan it. So I'm going to go do that. I'm going to put this on my scanner and then I'm going to show you guys what I do on the computer to make it work. All right, everyone. I'm here in Photoshop, and I'm going to be using Photoshop to do this tutorial. I will also show how to use GIMP, G-I-M-P, uh, which is an image manipulator that is freeware. But for now, I'm going to show you the Photoshop version. And those of you who do not have access to either of these, you can go to a Kinko's or something like that and get a photocopy of your image and your drawing. But it does have to be a toner-based printer. So most Xerox machines, things like that, are toner based. They're not an inkjet based, so you should be able to use one of those. And you just bring that home and you do the same process for transferring. But first, we're going to uh, import my image and scan it. So we're going to go to File up here, go to Import, and this WIA Support is what I'm going to click on. Now we're going to choose our destination. I always do that, and Art for all my art and this bottom one here create unique subfolder I always unclick that because then I'm gonna get tons of folders in my file and or in my folder that says art and I don't want tons of folders I'm gonna hit start and then right here okay just the quality of the scan picture I'm gonna change this to 300 I do this because I want a higher resolution. And I'm going to hit preview. And then we wait on the scanner to scan the image in real quick. This shows us what it's going to look like. And you notice it automatically cropped here. I don't want it to automatically crop. I want it to do this. So I'm just going to adjust it. I had drawn on there the edge of what my block would be right here and I'm just gonna hit scan and then we're just gonna wait for the image to transfer it doesn't take that long with this scanner that I have it's just an all-in-one Canon that I bought it works pretty well I actually pleasantly surprised with this scanner it works well so here's my image the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the paintbrush tool over here and then I'm going to make sure this is on white up here. And there's a few little dots here. I'm just going to clean those up just to make my life easier. Just going to remove those. As you can see, my image is pretty crisp here. This scanner, for some reason, and Photoshop combination, does a good job to start out with. But what I'm going to go to is come up here to uh, is it image? Yes, image and adjustments and go down to levels here. And you can see this little bit, this little box here. And I always take this left little triangle and move it to right about here. And take my right one here and move it to right about there. It's basically, it makes everything on here brighter and works better. Then I'll hit OK. I will save my image because it always, for some reason, wants to save it. I actually save as control, which is right here, file, save as, or shift control S. And it always, for some reason, wants to do a BMP. I don't like bitmap. So I'm just going to choose JPEG and I'm just going to call this one test. And hit save. I'm going to choose all my maximum options and just hit OK. Now, at this point, I would just go File, Print, right here. 
I'm going to choose my brother right here. This is my laser printer. I do have one, so I choose that and make sure it's on proper layout right here. And then I'm just going to hit print. And that's all there is to it. It's not much to this. Now stay tuned. I'm also going to show you uh, the GIMP, and which is a funny thing to say. But uh, I'm going to show you um, how to use GIMP if you need to use that if you don't have Photoshop. For those of you who don't have Photoshop, uh, you can get another image manipulation program that's for free. It's called GIMP or GNU Image Manipulation Program here. It's a freeware. It's real basic for the most part. I find it more cumbersome to use than um, Photoshop, mostly because Photoshop is actually designed by designers on how people use it. Uh, this is made by programmers and they're just kind of programming it. So it doesn't have the user interface that Photoshop does. So to get started, we're going to come up here and go to File, Create, Scanner Camera. I'm going to choose my scanner. I've got two here. Doesn't really matter because they're actually both the same thing, but you're going to choose what you need to choose. I'm going to choose the top one here. I'm going to hit select. It's going to bring this up, scan gear, and it always shows the latest thing you scan. So I scanned this once before, but we're going to do that again. So the first thing we do is select source. We're going to choose photo color, and then we're going to hit the preview button. going to do a quick preview right here as you can see destination print file output flexible that's fine adjust cropping frames these are telling you to do these things so I'm right on here I'm just gonna adjust my cropping just drag and click and hold down and draw a box I'm always gonna choose this correct fading it just brightens it up a little and I'm gonna hit scan and then we just wait for our scanner to do its job it doesn't really take long, you know. But, you know, if I was scanning at a really high resolution, then yeah, it would take a long time to scan this. But anything under 300 dpi typically does not take long. You will never have to scan anything above 300 dpi typically. Most printers will not print above 300 dpi. So it really doesn't help. All right, now that we've got our image in here, we're going to adjust it. So we come up here to where it says colors and go to levels. Just like in the Photoshop, you're just going to move this to a little bit to the right because you can see the little little dome here, which is up the black. And then we're going to come to the left and move this one just a little bit to the left. And then we're going to hit OK. Now there's a couple of dots in here. If they really bug you, you can use your paintbrush tool up here to clean them up. We really don't need to do that. Um, it's really not going to affect anything that we're doing. It's just a, oh look, we can clean it up. I'm going to do that though. And then we're going to come up here and hit save as. I'm just going to call it test. For some reason it only likes to do XCFs. I don't know why. I'm just going to hit save. Yes, it already exists, but I want to replace it anyways because it's something we, I'm just redoing this one. And then you can always export it as something else too. If you want to have your PNG or your um, JPEGs, you can do that from here and export. We're not going to do that. And then you just go up to your file, print, and you're going to choose your laser printer, which is my brother, then hit print. And that's all you really need to do. It's real simple, it's real basic, and it's easy to do. Um, so now let's get back to the actual work of carving and... All right, now that I've printed out my image, right here, just on, this is on a laser printer. We need to get our linoleum. So I have my block of linoleum here. I print on a six by nine here. But if you have larger pieces of linoleum, you can just cut it down. And I'm gonna show you guys how to do that here. Now, if you have to cut your linoleum like this, it's actually quite easy to do. So you'll want to measure how big you want your linoleum. 
pencil right here. So we know this is a 10 in, well, 10 in, was it a 7 eighths? Let's just make it down to 9 inches. So what we're going to do is we're just going to measure 9 inches on the back, right here. So I got nine inches there, and I'm just gonna draw a line on the back. Now you can either leave the ruler there. As you can see, I have my mark there. You can leave the ruler there if it makes it easier for you, and it probably will. And just get a box cutting knife like this. Extend your blade out and just lightly score the back a few times. You don't have to cut all the way through the linoleum. A lot of people try to and they get jagged cuts. You don't need to. You just need to score this burlap back. And once you do, just bend it like this and just snaps right off. That's all you need to do. The clean cut is typically very clean. I mean, if you're, I mean, it's not super, super straight and razor edged. You know, you can kind of see the edge of it there, but if that's really going to affect you much, then yeah, put some kind of cutting mat underneath and just go to town and just cut it multiple times till you get, get it really nice and smooth. Now they do sell flooring knives, which are basically like this, except it's got a little hook blade right here and you just put it in there and sh go like that. And it's actually very easy to use those, but to get them straight, you're going to have to do a little bit of probably finagling. But that's all you need to do for that. So now I prep my linoleum. And I do that by getting my linoleum ready. I take a little container I've got here. And then I use a little bit of isopel alcohol. I just put a little bit in the bottom, as you can see there doesn't need a whole lot and I also get a small little wash brush you can get like a one inch one that would also be fine it really doesn't matter uh, in fact a bigger brush would probably work better so I'm gonna get this one out right here and these are just really inexpensive Princeton brush set that I got from a Princeton brush set it's gold Taclon it's nothing nothing too fancy and then I take my Pinata color. It's a alcohol-based dye. Or alcohol-based ink, I should say. Now this stuff is really strong to begin with, so I am just thinning it down. I'm going to put a little bit in here. Like so. Mix it around. And then dip my brush in. Now, I probably didn't use enough ink here. I'm going to have to use a little bit more. Because it's not dark enough. The nice thing about alcohol is it dries up fairly quickly. Now, you can try some other forms of ink, but you want to stay away from certain things because it doesn't always work uh, with the transfer process that we're going to do. So as you can see, I'm just going to stick this, you know, wipe this on here. And I'm just, I chose an orangish, reddish color. Um, I like that color. You could choose any color you want, but I like the reddish colors. Um, it makes it easier for me. And the reason I do this, I'm just going to keep painting it on until I get a good coating on it good color and it's gonna dry fairly quickly here because when I put it on straight with this because I did that I put it straight on here it didn't want to it got too thick now since I've covered this entire thing with 
the alcohol, it's working fine. But I had to get this entire thing on there and it was super dark and I was not very happy with that result. So what I ended up doing was I ended up discovering thin it down. Because otherwise what I have to do is I would coat this entire thing and use a lot of this to do so. Put that out of the way. And then I'd have to take alcohol on a paper towel and wipe away excess so it wasn't super dark. Now I do this so that way I can see where I carve when I carve this product. And it's almost completely dry. It dries very quickly. That's the nice thing about alcohol. It just evaporates right out. So it works very quickly. Next I'm going to get my blue painter's tape and my bone folder. I need that. And I've got my image here. And it's a little, it still feels a little tacky in some areas, but that's going to be okay. It's not going to cause a problem. And I know where the edges of my lino are approximately. So I'm going to put this on there. Ballparking it. As long as I get the edges where I need to. Take a little bit of my tape here. And only put one on the top. I'm going to burnish this part down. And then I kind of burnish it right into the corner, as you can see here. Which actually causes the tape to lift up. And then I burnish that down. So it creates a nice, tight seal on it like that. And I just go right along the edge there as best as I can. Now that I have that down, I might still need to keep my bone folder. And I grab one of my transfer markers. My blender. All right, now I've transferred my image. You can kind of see here. Oh, there it goes. This camera gets to get funky sometimes. But you can see there's the image. You can see it's been, you can see it bleeding through. And yeah, a little bit of the orange came off on the paper. That's fine. It doesn't cause a problem. As you can see, I've got my perfectly transferred image onto here. And then I'm going to start carving. First, I'm going to put down one of these non-slip mats down here. Because I like to use these. These things are a godsend. I think they're amazing. I get this stuff from, uh, where did I get it from? Harper Freight. And then I always use my bench hook. So my bench hook has, you know, it's got two sides, they're custom made bench hooks. And I always do this right here, you can see it, it's got a 45 degree angle cut here, the same width on the other side. And I've got the non-stick matte stuff also on this one. It is different material because I tried two different brands to see which one I liked better. Um, this one's kind of nice because it's all got these little grids and you could just tear it along the grids and put it right on here. Uh, but I like this stuff more. This is the stuff I got from Harbor Freight. I got this stuff from uh, Home Depot. But together they work just fine. They keep, as you can see, doesn't cause any shifting. This thing isn't going to shift. In fact, as I'm doing this, it's causing my entire table to shift, which is the camera is mounted to, so it looks like it's shifting. So this is always nice to have. Now, uh, bench hooks are a godsend because they help protect you. So you just put your lino right up to the edge. And that way you protect yourself when you carve. And I have these 45 degree cuts. So that way I can do this and hold it that way. That one's a little better. Um, that way I can hold it in different directions. Now when I begin carving here, okay, let's see here. 
Let's get a better angle here. Yeah, it's probably a little better here, isn't it? Yeah. So my favorite tools to use are the flex cuts. These are by far my favorite ones. Uh, they also make them individual tools with just handles. This is my medium sized V right here. Uh, I normally start out with this. Um, it's got the hand plastic handle. You can get a wood handle version. It's got this slit on the end, as you can see. And I always start out with my little V gouge, as you can see there. And what I do is I start out on the edge and I just carve away both. You can either use your V. I also like to use my little U. I, in fact, I actually like the little U a little bit better sometimes. So um, most people start out with the V. I actually use my little U. I'm going to put it back in my spot and actually go to it. And as you can see, there is a little line right there from where I haven't carved it. So what I will do is I will Go in there and mer uh, keep mer um, not merge over, but uh, just move it over a little bit with the blade. So I get it. But I like using the little U gouge. It just works a little better for me. Um, the nice thing about this kind of material, it makes it very easy not to slip because these things are sharp and you can hurt yourself with them. Uh, those are not from it, but I do have a few scars you can maybe see, but I've cut myself multiple times with my knives. You do have to be careful. Half the time I used to carve in front of the TV, and this thing, just this, would be sitting on my lap, and I'm just do, 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 boom, oh, stab myself, learn, really have to use the uh, bench hook, and it's a much better better idea if you do. Um, so I'm just going to start carving and I carve on both sides of my lines and things like that. Um, I will mostly stick with the small small things like this. And I always keep a little little cup nearby just to throw my scraps into so I'm not getting them all over the place. If you're just wondering what I do there. And then when I get into here, I'll probably use more of my V gouges and get into there that way. Because uh, the V gouges are very nice for more detail sometimes or getting in smaller areas. Because you can, as you can see, right there, very, very, very fine line with the V gouge. You can't do that with the U gouge so much. But if I go next to it, I can... Now, a little bit thicker line, as you can see. So you can control a lot of your line with, with the V-gouges. No, that one's really thick. And of course, the thicker it gets, the deeper it also carves. That's one of the reasons I like the U-gouge. It starts to carve deeper to start with. Um, and you can clear away more area, which is one of the things I like about it. So like I said, I'll just start carving here. Sometimes I'll take the little chips and throw them off early so they don't blind me. And there's a little finesse to this. You know, you can start out using very thin lines and just carving like I do here, getting a, you know, shaving away a little bit more and more. Or you can um, learn to do this with uh, simply adjusting the pressure that you need. So you kind of see how I start to carve. And then I'm going to carve this, guys. And then I will come and show you everything that I'm going to do because this is going to take a little while. This will probably take me over an hour to do. And 
while it's fun to watch someone carve, not really, I think it's incredibly boring to do, um, but I will, you know, but you guys will see the more finished project. I might do this as a speed up. We'll see how it plans out. Alrighty.
you can see, I've carved away pretty much all the detail area. All that's left is to carve away the outside area. That carving area that you saw took me two and a half hours. All of that was two and a half hours. That time sped that you saw was two and a half hours. It was a quite... That's the thing that takes the long spot lino is carving it. Now, when I do it like this and I go to carve away more, I normally end up grabbing a little bit wider... You gouge here. When I work with the bigger gouges, because I push, I'm going deeper and harder, I definitely will use more of the, um, I always try to carve away from me. When I'm using the smaller ones, sometimes you'll notice that I carve with me. And another thing you probably saw me doing is constantly rotating this and keeping my knife in one place. It made it makes it easier. So I'll normally carve this away with a little bit wider one just to make it easier. So that way I'm not going to accidentally ruin something as I carve away the larger areas because the larger areas you want to get them done as fast as possible. So I'm going to do this outside part here with you guys and then I'm going to speed up the video again just because it will take a while to do that too. It will probably take another half hour to 45 minutes. piece. Hopefully it doesn't take that long. We'll see. In case anyone is wondering, I do use the basic wood cutting kit from Flex Cut, which has, uh, I believe, nine or ten different blades. It's supposed to have one. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten blades. It's an eleven piece set. One of the blades or one of the pieces considered the handle there. I'm actually missing a blade out of it, which is actually quite upsetting. And I gotta find a place to buy that one blade from. Because it was a nice good sized U gouge. A little bit bigger than this one, not as big as the other one. And I really liked it, but it's just Kind of sad that I I lost it. Not entirely sure where it disappeared to. So when I begin to start carving with this, this is the like I said the ten piece set. I'll probably do this one next, which is a shallower U gouge, followed by the larger U gouge here. And those will be the ones I'll use. And then after I get it carved away, there will be a lot of rippling. Um, let's see if you can see that. I'll show this to you real quick. And I tend to carve pretty deep here on this part. It's just how I've always carved it. If you notice there's a lot of this right here, this uh, texture. You know, and it, it's from the gouge and, you know, because it's a U, the dip down and the high points and things like that. So normally what I end up doing is I end up grabbing the widest, flattest one I have. It's still a U, still got a little bit of curve on it. And then I will go like this. And try to smooth it out a little bit. Because doing so allows me to, uh, when I ink, I get less of these ridges on here. And I don't want those. Now, if you don't care if you have those ridges, because some people like the inclusions there, um, it could be very useful for you. But I don't. So I'm going to go ahead and finish carving this. <music>
as you can see, here is the final product. I've flattened out a lot of this quite a bit, so there's less ridge. I mean, there's always going to be some. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you notice here, you can kind of see in a few spots, especially right here, where I carved way too deep and basically cut through to the burlap in the back. That is actually not a problem. You can do that. That's not a problem. I've actually seen people who will sit there and trace along the outside with an X-Acto knife right here and cut away all this extra so they don't ever accidentally get ink on it or they just prefer to print that way. I like having it the full size like this, as you can see, so that way I know where the edge of my block is, especially in relation to my paper. If I have to figure out, make sure this is right, I mean, I could do that. I could set it down on something and do all that and then do that. But I, I'd normally take these and then I'll, I'll glue this to a piece of wood too uh, when I go to print. And the reason I do that is because I find when I'm printing, if I just, even using this non-slip stuff, it likes to still slide around. So I find that if I glue it to a piece of wood and then print on top of this, it works much better. So I will glue this down to a piece of wood. Um, I just use wood glue to do it on the back. And then I just put some heavy books on top of it and some, I put wax paper on top of it and some heavy books on top of that and just let it sit there. So that way if any glue oozes out, it doesn't get on my books. Because I got some nice printmaking books. They're pretty friggin' heavy. But I know I was going to say I was going to show you how to do a complete lino print. I'm just going to stop today. I lied. I'm not. Um, mostly because I didn't realize how long all this was going to take. So what I'm going to do is break this into two videos. So this is the first video. It will be the carving video. And then the second one will be me doing the rest of the prep work and everything else that I need to do. So I will see I will see you guys next week or yes, next week when I post the next video up. Uh, and that one will be how to do everything you need to do. Until next time guys. See ya. Bye. Everyone, thanks for watching my video. You can give me some much needed support by clicking the thumbs up down. That helps support me. Also, you can follow me on Instagram at Matt Pernet. The link will be down below. Also, finally, I do have an Etsy shop. You can purchase a print from me. You can just go to my Etsy shop. It's called Printing Pernet, or there's a link down below. Until next time, guys. Thank you.